Thank you. Uh, as we started at our initial training, we're going to start on time and end on time. Those things that we don't get to, we'll carry over to the next. We've got a long process in front of us. We, everyone is deliberative about this, so I want to make sure we know we're going to end at 8, at eight o'clock. So we're going to adjust the, the, uh, this a little bit. Um, Dr. Rosenboom, bomb. <laughs> And that's all right. I'm, it's been a long day. And, and Dr. Watson are going to talk about the, the COCAL, and then we'll save 10 minutes for public comment because we're required to under our, and, that's a, and there are many ways to communicate with us, but at least we, we need to have a, a place for public comment. There's also now websites, face pages, and, and those sorts of things. So we have five people signed up for public comment, two minutes apiece. That'll take 10 minutes. Okay, all right. Uh, oh, <laughs> okay. It'll take uh, ten minutes. Yes. Yeah. So let me go. get started here. Um, I don't. I'm going to go through the whole role of the COCAL with you because it's in the settlement. You you've got a good sense of what that is. Working with the COAB group to make this happen. And uh, I, just a couple general comments about it. Um, you know. It is the job to review the Portland Police Department for compliance with the settlement, okay, and to report back to you guys about that and get your input on that. Um, so they're developing, they need to develop and are in the business of developing state-of-the-art policies and procedures to guide police officers in the discretion that they need to use during critical incidents. And this is called administrative rulemaking for those of you. It's a, an important tool in reforming police organizations. But I think the bigger part, and we're working with DOJ and the COCAL to review their policies and w with you to see that they have all the right language in them, kind of like our discussion tonight about uh, rules, uh, but also our best state-of-the-art uh, evidence-based practice. But really, it's about implementing a lot of these policies and, and procedures with high integrity, with high quality, so that we were going to monitor their compliance in that regard. And are they implementing state-of-the-art training, for example? Do they have the data systems built and in place that capture this critical information that allows us to identify cases that are problematic, but also monitor performance overall? Uh, are the incidents being reported, the use of force reports, and how well? Uh, are incidents being reviewed? And you know, are out of policy incidents being investigated? And when uh, that is exist, is discipline being applied inappropriately? And so there's a whole process that the settlement puts in place that the COCAL is going to be carefully looking at. And with your input, we'll be reporting back to you on a quarterly basis too, but also monthly basis when your meetings occur. So we're going to, we don't want to bore you with any details about that tonight, and we're working on it. It's an iterative process. But I, I want to say that uh, beyond implementation, there's the issue of impact. The state, the settlement also refers to do these changes make a difference? Does it really improve com police community relations? Do, do the number of incidents go down? Do, uh, and so we will be monitoring that both in the short term and the long term and reporting that back to you. How well are they doing? And if you look at the 20 plus prior uh, settlements around the country over the last 20 years, uh, you see that some of them made some major innovations in policing that, that stuck and that, that were helpful. Uh, but a lot of things in some departments didn't stick and they just kind of <laughs> evaporated over time. And so it's important to work on the institutionalization of change so that in five years it doesn't go away and things go back to the way they were. Uh, it's kind of, there, there is this kind of entropy that occurs in these processes. But it, anyway, the point is this process through community engagement and community oversight can help that institutionalization. And I think that we want to work with you on that as well. So uh, on to the issue of um, where do we go from here, Amy? Are we on to, we're skipping over a lot of slides and stuff just so we can Keep going, Tom. Let's see. Subcommittees. So uh, Justice Timunas and the group uh, felt that there has to be, you use the word organized, coordinated. I like that. Effort. Uh, as you know, big committees are kind of dysfunctional sometimes, right? Because there's too many people and you can't, 
get anything done. So breaking into subcommittees is really an effective way to get things done. We're going to propose four subcommittees. It's a lot, but and we hope that you sign up for maybe even more than one. But um, the I, will you go ahead, Amy, and explain okay. what we plan, and then w we want to leave time for comments. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm passing a half sheet around for the members and the alternates to fill out, and I'll explain what it is. Just take um, one. We're proposing four subcommittees, and of course, over time, different subcommittees could be added, so it's not set in stone. But the first one would be the Mental Health Crisis Response Subcommittee, and that subcommittee would look more closely at reviewing um, changes in PPB policy and their training related to mental health crisis response, but also then looking at how we can um, assess the impact of these changes and make recommendations. So we would be meeting and talking about looking at changes, looking at the sources of information that are available, but also asking for feedback on what other sources of information and what other questions that we need to ask. Um, and then this subcommittee would then report back to the COAB as a whole to kind of move it forward to make recommendations um, to PPB. Okay. We'll go on to the second one. The second committee is the Community Outreach Engagement Plan Committee, and this one will really look at PPB's um, community outreach and engagement plan um, and make recommendations and also help us work on ways of actually um, assessing how well that plan is working, um, how over time the community survey, which is a separate committee, but will be working somewhat with this committee, um, how we're able to assess sort of changes in public perception and public experience with um, these community engagement and outreach uh, activities. Let me, let me add something there. I wanted to add something to this. Uh, I, th I think we have emphasized that out of all the things that, that we're doing, getting this community outreach and engagement plan right it is a hugely significant to what we're doing. So um, I have been in the process of identifying the, for lack of a better word, community police groups that exist in Portland. There are over 200. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there, there's over 200. Um, part of my job will be to contact those groups to facilitate <coughs> their, their comments and input to us in our public uh, town hall meetings because this is not about the PPB giving us their engagement plan. This is us as the community having a significant role to play in determining what kind of policing, what kind of community engagement uh, is involved in this. So I want to encourage people to think about the community engagement piece. Um, it's going to be a lot of work, but I'm very <coughs> enthusiastic that this is the, one of the keys to our success here. And just to give you a, 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 just a little example of one of the things, the mayor, uh, the chief, uh, and I are going to appear at De La Salle uh, North Catholic High School um, on Lombard off, uh, I think it's, is it off MLK or Interstate? I can't remember which, um, at, a, at a youth forum on, on what we're doing. And so this is the kind of, then we, we as this subcommittee, need to formulate a, and coalesce all the things that <coughs> we're getting from the community as we collaborate with the PPB to put together this, this program. So I wanted to make sure you know it's, we're not just getting their stuff. Right. We have to create and, and want to get our own because I think that's crucial to this. Okay. Um, <laughs> when I read um, a little bit before this and you know, um, doing my research, that was something that you totally committed to as, as well as Chief O'Day that was what he said, and I've been hearing it's just like a lot of community engagement, which is very much important to the process of change in our um, in our system here in Portland, Oregon. So um, those are very, very important pieces to, to definitely be looking at. So I'll be operating um, out of our office that's being established in the Rosewood Initiative. Um, I have some administrative help right now. We don't have it permanent yet, but we'll, we'll, we'll be, be operating out of that. And, and Rebecca Allen is a third-year law student uh, 
who uh, at Willamette, who's an extern to me, who will be working with our our uh, community engagement. And I'm going to keep uh, Joanne Hardesty on the on the. She's promised me with her list. Uh, so we're not we're not just relying on a police list, but the community lists of get of where we go. So thank you, Amy. I just wanted to make that comment. So then the next subcommittee is really, um, the committee will be looking at the police policies and data systems related to use of force. So um, what are the policy changes that have been made or in process? Are, is it being implemented the way it needs to be? What changes need to be made? But then also looking at whether the data the systems to, to really track this information and use it are in place. Um, so it's really focused at related to the use of force and accountability systems within PPB. Does that make sense? Yeah, and you don't have to have any technical skills right. to be on this. It may sound that way, but it's more about your, you know, helping us think through the use of force measures. So we can go through them and then come back and say, this is what they have, this is what we're finding, what questions do we need to ask, or, or where else do we need to, to look for data on this to, to vet the data. Okay. And Tom on our team will be doing a lot of the work in the bowels of the police department, working with them to help construct and extract the data that we need. Uh, the community survey committee, I want to talk about this because it ties in with what both Justice Muniz is saying, but this is part of the, um, the settlement, uh, that there would be a community survey. We need to move quickly on this. As you may recall, the language says that by April of this year, <coughs> given when it started, uh, we need to have this in the field and being done. Uh, so we want to at least have it started in April. Um, the, the, the monitor, implementation, interpret. We need the committee to help us put together the survey to help us make sense of the results. Let me suggest several things. We spent, we're, we're actually, we w I would be willing to call ourselves an expert on this because we, we do lots of community surveys, okay, in many cities. I'm doing surveys in uh, 55 cities right now. Uh, but we, um, we th feel that as part of the work here in, Chica in uh, Portland, we need, we, we need to team up with Portland State University. I've looked at their work uh, carefully, and they are highly professional people, uh, and it meets the standards of good research. And they've done some work previously on this. Uh, they've also used some of our questions that we've done in other cities, so I feel <coughs> pretty good about it. But there's several things. Uh, the, 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 the settlement talks about um, getting the community's perceptions and experiences with the police department's outreach and engagement strategies. So actually they're, they're existing in the future. So it's partly, is there improvement in their outreach plan? And we need to get a baseline early on, and we've talked with the police about this, and uh, of uh, how the community feels about what the police department's been doing up to this point. And in addition to that, the settlement also really asks us to look at the impact of all this in the long run on the public's view of the police and legitimacy of the police. They're tr basically the public's trust and confidence in the police. And these surveys are uniquely designed to do that. Um, we, can, we have measures of that in Portland already. We'd like to repeat some of those. But it's also a chance on this survey for us to get your input to add some new things. I think really we need to add more to this effort. And, and this is also a chance you can even have, you know, one, you don't like a lot of open-ended questions because they're hard to analyze, but one that asks them about what recommendations they have or, or, you know, that you guys were talking about various mechanisms for community input. This would be a broad sample of a thousand people in Portland that uh, randomly selected. In addition to that, we feel that the experiences people have had with the police with regard to use of force, not just that, but other things that matter. Most complaints to the city about police uh, behavior in most cities are about language or being rude or inconsiderate. They're not always use of force, but use of force is, they're low levels of use of force. Use of force is defined here differently, but we can measure that as well among the community, but we'd want a more recent sample of people who have had contact with the police. The third uh, possibility for a survey too that we, is uh, as Justice Demunis was pointing out, and you guys have pointed out, the need to expand your partnerships here. The, co the COAB is just the central core of the heart, but you've got all these different uh, 
parts of the community that need to be represented. So community organizations, a, a, a survey of them in particular would give you a different data set, and I think that's worth doing. Uh, and take that big list that you're all gonna work from and that he's gonna work from and survey them up front, you know, about what they think and what needs to be done. So these are possibilities. If you want to be on this committee, you could help us think through that over the next. We need to get moving on that, though, in the next month. And uh, we have a lot of suggested questions that, that have been validated through previous surveys, but it needs to be tailored and new questions need to be added. Uh, and I can help chair that committee and work with people on that. So, um, what, so yeah. what I did pass around is that half sheet. If people could fill out kind of what committees they're willing to be on, what their preferences are for committees, so that way we can put together sort of a proposed um, basically list of the members of the subcommittees and then you know see what people think of that. Otherwise, we could be here for hours too trying to put together the committee. So just as a way to get, get started on creating those so we can, particularly the community survey one really needs to hit the ground pretty quickly so that we can start bringing in information and getting feedback on it. Assuming yeah. that people are not gonna be able to fill this out tonight. You can email. Um, we could create an electronic version mm -hmm. and it could be emailed out to everybody so you can respond electronically. Um, and then, to, and I think the best is respond to Amy um, mm -hmm. Ruiz about this and we'll get everything uh, collected. And I think also there could be questions about these committees, so you can address them to the COCAL, e uh, either directly to me or to, uh, to Dr. Rosenbaum and, and Dr. Watson. But we should, uh, oh, sorry. yeah, and then there's a schedule we want to get to too okay. before we, but go ahead. Philip? Yes, I'm sorry, this is Philip. I have a question real quick in regards to selection of subcommittees. Um, tell me what would happen if we all chose one specific <laughs> <laughs> Give me the answer. Oh boy, <laughs> that's we a tough know. one. I think we'd have to come back here and say, um, <laughs> well, we're I, not a I, 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 you know, I, anything's possible. I mean, we'll just feel lonely on the other committees. Uh, <laughs> but I think that with that many people, let's just say more realistically that a large <coughs> group of people want to be on one more than on the others. Um, as long as there's a few people on every committee, we'll feel comfortable. We, we're always going to report back to the whole co-op anyway about uh, approving any decisions. Uh, but as far as that larger group, it, that would be the same dysfunctionality that you face here as a large group. So there would be half <laughs> no offense. You know. I mean, but we have to. You'd have to. You'd have to get uh, a way, a mechanism, uh, for everyone to have input, such as the email process. Uh, and then reporting back to everybody and then doing it again, an iterative process of narrowing, trying to reach consensus. Okay, Christy? Yeah, and um, just because we haven't adopted the bylaws, um, I was hoping to get clarification on the, well, I'm, I want to emphasize the importance on alternates being a part of, mm -hmm. uh, a fully recognized part of members of subcommittees mm -hmm. and that that be instituted in the bylaws and so if that's the case, then I wanna just be clear that they can determine their preferences. Mm. Is that the case? That's the yeah, case. That's in our, we're yeah, and in our bylaws, at least uh, I incorporated one of those suggestions in the draft that I circulated that uh, alt alter alternates would uh, be eligible to serve in the subcommittees along with members of the general public, which is a custom when you have people who have interest and expertise in things that we're doing, so yes. So for the more popular one, so Game of Thrones was supposed to start April 12th, apparently maybe it starts earlier <laughs> on the more popular <laughs> subcommittees. <laughs> but, did you? Um, so we've been presented with a list of uh, four potential subcommittees where we mm -hmm. might have feedback that mm -hmm. here's an additional subcommittee I really think we need. Yep. Uh, how would you like to handle Send that? Send it to the COCOL. Okay, so we'll have that opportunity yep. to do that. Send it Excellent. to the COCOL. Absolutely. Thank you. Tom, you should put up the schedule thing. We, we wanted to talk to you about the, a schedule for some of this stuff because, and then there's going to be an open comment period, right? So we want to yeah. rush through this. But this is the well, last. Well, you don't have to rush. Well, well, this yeah. is, the, this is kind of important. Yeah. We're proposing yeah. this uh, as a schedule. Uh, the, 
There's a Help me out, Amy. The meetings in DARF are the uh, <coughs> regular monthly co-ab meetings. The, right. hard, the hard copy. They Everyone yeah. has a hard copy, oh, a hard that, copy that explains okay. those. And the ones with the double asterisks are the actual quarterly open town hall meetings where you guys are going to encourage more people to come and we present the quarterly uh, report, which you will have, I think, before then, right. a week or two before. Um, we, they're, they, they tend to be on Thursdays. It just so happens that it's hard for us to come on a Monday to Chica from Chicago to here because of our schedules right now until May when things change. We're both teaching large classes and stuff that meet on Mondays and Wednesdays. So we're hoping you, you guys can live with that because that way we can be here too. And, uh, but that's, that's a plan that goes, now that does not include the subcommittees. I just realized no, that. We'll have, yeah. to, we'll have to work out our subcommittee schedules as we go. On your own. Yeah, yeah. each group may yeah. have a different yeah. kind of schedule. I think it's important to also say, and I'll get to you, Rochelle, that um, we're, we're not gonna be meeting here all the time, that our, our locations will move, will move around. This was what we could do with the time frame that we were working with. But they will, they will move around and be in different locations and some will be more convenient to you than this perhaps and, and others perhaps not. But we do need to, we, we, we should probably get feedback but we really need to set this schedule in, and it's done in accordance with the settlement agreement because we ha the settlement agreement requires these quarterly meetings um, and then we have the, the, the two hours, uh, we have to have meetings during the month, w once a month. Um, and so this is, a, uh, I think, a, a good approximation of how we should do our business. Rochelle? Uh, I have a, an issue with the April 2nd meeting, which is a public town hall meeting. Mm -hmm. And the, the date is the night before um, a weekend of religious holidays for both mm -hmm. Christians and Jews. Mm -hmm. And I know personally I will not be here. Um, and I don't know if other people have, a, have an issue with that date. Could you email the COCOL so we can preserve that and figure out what to do? But that, there's a, I think there's a community, the survey requirement and, and the meeting requirements put us on the second. It was April. basically we have to have two public town hall meetings within the first 90 days. So one of them is the quarterly <coughs> meeting that can also be the town hall meeting and we needed one additional meeting. Um, well, we'll deal with, we'll send, yeah. send that to us and we'll try to work that out. Yeah. I Thank see. You. Okay. That's a Thursday. It's a Thursday, good So Friday, what, so. what else would be uh, uh, n excluded around that time period? The third as well, let's see. The third, right. so if you did it earlier, like on the first day. Okay, okay, okay. I know you have a problem getting here, but. Yeah, well, we don't, yeah. We'll well, we'll try to okay. accommodate we'll, and we'll do work out we best we can. Emmanuel, did you have your gavel up? functions or the bylaw somewhere, but just want to go on record and just have us also keep in mind that folks who are being released from incarceration also have mental illnesses, other additional barriers that may be four and five times higher than the regular population of people. Mm -hmm. um, and make sure that I don't know exactly where it would go, but I did just want to get it out there and just continue to just reiterate that every time I come to make sure that we get that point in there because at least 90% people get released and they have additional um, barriers on top of being a felon, on top of being a, you know, having fines and fees to pay, and their interaction with the police may be greater because they're on parole and probation. So that also plays a big part in the COAB and, and reducing recidivism and everything with a juvenile justice to adults. So just wanted to make that uh, make that statement. Thank That's you. a really good point. Mm -hmm. B? Did you say 90% men have mental illness that are received? Um, at least 90% are released. Um, and it may be more, correct me if I'm wrong, but at least out of that, I know there are a high percentage of people who come out with additional mental illnesses, lack of medication, and so on and so forth, and yeah. I didn't, I didn't lack of health care services, so. One more thing, I'm not at all trying to diminish in any way. I'm actually trying to make it work in terms of schedule. 
But but what about Skyping? Would that I mean it, would that yeah. work for you all or or is, is so, it sometimes sometimes yeah. yeah. You know, I mean I'm just trying to We might be able to plan and get a facility and that so that we can undertake that kind of of uh, modern meeting especially on the subcommittees i mean we may have to do that because that group needs to meet uh, you know more more frequently yeah, yeah. <coughs> everybody is there a proposed time to do these mistakes <coughs> it's up to you guys six yeah. six o'clock or i think we'll try to keep on our schedule of six at six o'clock we doesn't say that but that's generally what <coughs> seemed to work everyone has jobs um so if if you have feedback about that and want to suggest anything else, you could email the co Corey, you had your gavel up? Yeah, I, I, I feel like it's worth mentioning that on the uh, days, particularly on the town hall days, that we need to, as a principal, find a space that's closer to downtown okay. on the max line. Um, Great suggestion. It's, it's more than just a, a bit of convenience. It's actually an accessibility issue for lots of folks, and it's also... Uh, a class issue because most people, I'm lucky enough to have a partner we can afford a car, but I spent an hour and 15 minutes driving here today. And for a lot of people who need to be involved in this process, that was just kind of ignored when the space was chosen. Well, I, I shouldn't say it was ignored, but it was, it, it was highly underestimated about what impact that has, not only on the current co-ab, but also folks who want to attend. Um, so I would really strongly suggest that that be made a priority at the top of the list of things that need to get done, particularly for the, the quarterly meetings, but I would like to see that starting immediately, that we start looking for a closer space, or at least begin talking about that. Thank you, Corey. I think that's an excellent comment. And um, <coughs> uh, I've just been uh, handed a note. Ten this minutes. is an important one, too. Uh, please ask if members want to be fed each time. All <laughs> 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 right. However, okay, there seemed to be a majority so. vote or consensus <laughs> on that. Okay. Budget time. budget's limited, but we'll try to get this thing working. So, okay. And, yeah. Um, I just wanted to piggyback off of uh, Mr. Murphy's thing about uh, closer to something or another. Um. I come from Oregon City and I'm taking public transportation, so I don't understand the necessity for being in a specific centralized, aren't we centralized? Um, well, just to clarify, like for example, if people with mobility issues want to come, TriMet, it's harder for them to get to eyeline areas using TriMet, even oh, if they I use know. Lyft, um, and as you know. And then also, I think, <coughs> I understand that this is, an immediate space, but I think we also have to think about geographically where people are, and I think that communities that are affected, particularly people who are receiving mental health services, drug counseling services, and uh, <coughs> after incarceration services are, I believe, based on my somewhat expansive knowledge, but not of everything, but a lot of those core services are centralized downtown mm -hmm. because of the max line, so that was the impetus for my statement. Uh, Amy has been very dutifully taking the minutes, the notes of, what, of what's been, and she'll circulate those to all of us, so that will trigger what we've been talking about and, and make sure that we can, we're all on the same uh, page with this. Okay, all right, I'd like to, we, I'd like to move to our public comment. Um, we've got uh, 12 minutes, we have six people. We divide that time. Uh, May Wilson is first. Um, I wanted to advocate uh, for us to be written in as one of the community groups that you consider liaison with in your bylaws. Um, we are an 11 member committee. We've been um, the citizen oversight committee for the last since 2001. Uh, we hear complaints that citizens express when they uh, disagree with the findings of the police bureau regarding their complaints. We also can make policy recommendations. And we have a historical knowledge of a lot of the stuff that, you've been, that you wanna focus on. Um, we're also written into the DOJ agreement as one of the integral parts that 
we're trying to look at when we're talking about citizen oversight. So you talk about um, a lot of different community groups in here that I think are really important, and I just believe the CRC should be one of them as well. Thank you. Dan Handelman. Hi, I'm Dan Handelman with Portland Cop Watch. I know some of you, but not all of you. Um, I'm very glad to see this getting off the ground. Uh, people have asked us why we didn't want to serve on the committee it's because we have a lot of concerns that the uh, agreement, settlement agreement, doesn't go far enough. Uh, and we have an 11 point uh, essay that we read in the court that you can look up online if you want to find out more about our concerns. But I'm hearing some, something that's very encouraging, which is that people are open to hearing stuff that's not in the settlement agreement. And I hope that you stick to that as you move forward. Uh, and I hope sure. that, um, I, I also want to explain that we, for many years, were reluctant to having DOJ come to town because we didn't want to end up in a position where the federal government was telling us what to do in our local police departments, bureau in this case, um, but ha that happens in other cities. Uh, and the fact that we're part of this experiment where they're letting the community be part of the settlement uh, makes us feel a lot better as a group <coughs> institutionally about how things are moving forward. Um, in terms of the subcommittees, I hope you all come up with a fifth subcommittee because it breaks down more evenly, five pe 15 <laughs> people in five groups, you know, it just makes more sense. Um, one of the suggestions I have is that, that in, even though there's policies involved in some of the subcommittees, there's directives that the Portland police are posting every month because of the settlement agreement. They started doing it a year ago before you were even a twinkle in the settlement agreement's eye. Uh, and they've already made changes to like the, the use of force policies and a lot of policies and it'd be good to have people looking at those, even the ones that don't fall in other <coughs> categories. Uh, hopefully, and I didn't, I didn't hear this, I hope, I didn't, I'm not sure if it's because the sound gets lost in this room, if the subcommittees are bringing their reviews of like community survey back to the whole group for a vote before mm -hmm. it's approved? Okay, yeah. that's good. Because that's not in the bylaws that subcommittees can't um, make decisions for the whole group. Uh, and I just hope that you look at the, when you're looking at uh, interacting with a group like the CRC, look at what nights they meet and try not to set your big public hearings on those nights. Um, for instance, the first Wednesday of the month, April 1st, would be a conference. So take a look at those schedules too when you're scheduling your meetings. Thank you. Emmanuel, did you sign did you sign up to make a public comment? Oh, yeah. So you made it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I'll just whisper. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, it's more like it is a comment, but I was like, do I raise it? So anyway, um, Mr. Rosenbaum, Miss Amy, and Tom, is it? Yes. As we progress and we move forward, are we able to glean from you guys some of the things that you guys have worked with and seen in Chicago, being that they have, may have a, they do have a higher homicide rate, maybe more interactions with police officers and whatnot. Can we glean that from you and you give us some suggestions on what you think Portland should do? Because we're not Chicago, we're not DC, we're not Baltimore, Maryland, but we can get there pretty fast. And even though there's a, a big shift in, there's a difference between, uh, we may have less black people here, but higher incidents, or they may have more black and Latino people there. What can we get or what can, are we able to ask you guys or do you guys volunteer it um, willingly? or we have to make that request to get some of that information. Um, yeah, that was my comment. Um, first, I apologize for ruffling any uh, feathers of officers uh, who are here present, um, but I do think that um, on top of a failure on police of uh, use of force policies, um, from what I've seen filming officers, they should also get failures on policies, training, and recruitment. Many of the policies that are in place currently lead to the use of force escalations and the training as well. And use of force doesn't have to be physical. You know, a perfect example is this thing they call sweeps, which just in of its general, its term sweeps is very disingenuous to the action that's occurring because what they do is they literally are sweeping homeless people off the sidewalks in the early crack of dawn. And when this happens, Sometimes the homeless person that is being swept, just like a piece of lint or you would sweep your kitchen floor, they actually have their, their, uh, you know, their stuff confiscated. 
and then it's, it's removed to a place that's way up Barber Boulevard. When you do that, when the police are doing this, instituting this insane dehumanizing policy, they kill people. You know, there's actually been an Oregonian article that broke my heart. I read this a couple days ago about a gentleman named Alvin Smith. He was swept out from underneath the bridge he was staying at. The police confiscated his tent and he died from hypothermia four days later. So we can't have our police officers killing people with their policies. This needs to get addressed. And on top of that, strongly recommend, strongly recommend. I see profiling all the time when, I, when I'm filming officers. It happens often. And I'm not just talking about racial profiling. I'm also talking about homeless profiling, felon profiling. These things do happen. They need to stop. We need to take a stand and we need to explain to the officers, you know, we are the ones paying you to protect us. You're not protecting us when you are having these kind of confrontations with people and escalating them and then robbing them of their humanity, their dignity, and ultimately their lives. So I, I would highly recommend that a third part of this, interactions with people who are perceived by officers to be suffering a mental health crisis, homeless, um, or felons. I think to add those two factions of community and evaluate how these policies are being implemented on the street is a very important, crucial thing that's going to save lives and uh, restore the dignity of the police force. Thank you, Mr. Anthony. Uh, Charles Johnson. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Uh, thanks especially to the volunteer COAB members. And also thanks to many citizens who were in a four-hour hearing Thursday night as we tried to get the city to understand that we do not need to set two more police officers liaisoning with the JTTF, the Joint Terrorism Task Force, is a waste of police resources. Um, there's a problem with this whole settlement agreement in that we don't need to be feeding the police bureau, we need to be starving the police bureau. It didn't need 26 million more dollars. So I wanna encourage everyone that's in this room as a COAB member and involved citizens to think about the fact that crime is going down and police budgets can go the same direction. Um, and I, we also have somewhat of the answer right here in this room. Um, we talked at the beginning about bylaws and language. And we hear crazy phrases in the news all the time, like police commissioner Bill Bratton in New York and police commissioner here. The citizens should control the police through a real police commission. This COAB is a short-term existing body during a legal settlement, but it should grow to become the citizens' police commission that has authority over the contract of the Portland Police Bureau, not entrusting it to one of the five commissioners at City Hall or the five commissioners there. So um, although you have a specific legal function to help implement this agreement, I encourage you all to grow your networks and to grow community control of the police and help the police become more like the people we wanna be in the community, less militarized, less body armor, greater safety in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Joanne Hardesty. Uh, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to address you tonight, and I want to say I am so happy so far with the work of the COAB. Uh, uh, just from sitting here tonight, it's clear that you're all committed to this effort, and I thank you for the time that you're going to volunteer over the next few years. Uh, a couple of points I wanted to make as I review the bylaws you will spend an awful lot of time talking to police-created advisory committees. Uh, and it seems over, over, uh, uh, overboard that you're meeting with like the training advisory committee, the African-American advisory committee, this advisory committee, that advisory committee, and most of those committees were put in place. They had to be police approved. They had to sign a confidentiality agreement, um, and they had to go through a background check. And so it's not really the public that you say you want to talk to if you're spending all your time talking to police-approved committees. And so I would recommend that you put all those police-approved committees in a room and have one meeting with them. And then you can ask them all the questions you need to ask them. Because the answers you're going to get is going to be from the public and not from those police-created advisory committees. The other thing I want to uh, share with you is that uh, this community has no trust in Portland State University to do a, a evaluation or an investigation about community concerns about Portland Place. They have had an incestuous relationship for a long, long time. And just before this group came together, 
our last police chief went out and secretly had Brian do a survey that he tried to present to the city council mm -hmm. as the COAB. He had to have it done before the COAB was in place. Mm -hmm. And it was because of community members like myself who went to the city council meeting and stopped them from signing a three-year contract mm -hmm. with Brian uh, to do this survey. He'd already developed it. It's already on the police bureau's website. It is not a community survey. It is not the kind of questions that this community would be asking if we were conducting a survey. Okay. We have no trust in him. Find someone else. There are other universities that would be willing to do the work. Thank you. Thank you. It, well, it's 8 o'clock. Thank you. You did? I'm sorry, Sam. We have one more. Okay. One more. One more. One Very more. quickly because we're going to quit at 8. My name is Sam Sachs. I'm the Human Rights Commissioner for the City of Portland. I'm also the Chair of the Community Police Relations Committee, um, the committee you'll be doing a lot of work with. So my email is the no hate zone at yahoo.com. If you'd like to get a hold of me or contact me, I have cards. But I just want to introduce myself. We'll be working together collaboratively over the next few years. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Let, well, last thing, let's thank our interpreters for their excellent job. Adjourned.